one. My guest today is Savish from Al Mokadima, and we, today we're going to talk about the rise of Islam. And Islamic history, for those who may not have looked into it too much, is super fascinating. And it has heroes and empires like from the Umayyad Caliphate to the Ottoman Empire, and uh, people like Saladin, Mehmed II, and Suleiman the Great, to mention a few. But today we're going to start with the origin of the rise of Islam about Muhammad and how what paved the way to, for Islam to rise. And um, but first, before we start on that part, I, I want to start talking about your YouTube channel a little bit, which recently gained 100,000 subscribers. So, congratulations! And what made you start Al Mutadima? Did you think you would get this far? Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, in terms of uh, the and also thank you for the congratulations. Uh, that milestone I reached uh, in June or July, I think the channel. So yeah. Uh, in terms of how I started the channel, well, I started it back in 2018 uh, to mix my love for both animation and history. I used to play a video game that uh, called Crusader Kings 2 a lot back in the day, and I always uh, found myself narrating the events that were happening in the game. Uh, so I thought that I should maybe use my skills and get on uh, making videos about that. But what was sort of the nail in the coffin uh, was the fact that Crash Course has only two videos um, throughout their, their, both their world series, world history series uh, that deal with Islam. And that was just disappointing because that history is so rich. All the things that they, yeah. uh, that, that entire civilization achieved uh, is just not talked about as much as mm. it should be. Kings and Generals made a few, but not too much either on the topic. Yeah, Kings and Generals made a few. Uh, Invicta made, I think, one or two. Uh, armchair Historian made. But I, I think, uh, and this might be arrogant of me to assume or believe, but I think that after my channel, uh, there, there has been an increase in, in yeah. Islamic, in, in an interest in Islamic history, in the YouTube history mm -hmm. sphere. And, that's, and I, think, I think it's a good thing because when... I think especially when it comes to Islam, it's religion, people still to this day tend to misunderstand and it's mis and, they, and they see just the extremists of Islam and they don't, if, especially in this case, I think it's important to as well understand the history of Islam, to understand the religion, especially for us Westerners to understand what it's about, don't you think? Yeah, a lot of uh, Islamic history is seen through well we live in a post 9 11 world so uh at that point when 9 11 happened a lot of interest was generated in islam uh but unfortunately that interest had negative um i guess uh, i want to say assumptions or presumptions mm -hmm. already uh that this was a an inherently violent religion or that mm -hmm. you know these things but then that was projected back to the Crusades, which is sort of the first introduction um, that many in the West received to the Islamic world. So yeah, all, the, all that history is sort of dialed down into the violent conflicts between uh, between sort of these two religions rather than these great powers, the Byzantines and the Umayyads or uh, the Byzantines and the Ottomans or the, um, the uh, Habsburgs and the Ottomans. And yeah. it's, it's dialed down to just one single thing Muslims versus Christians. Which is quite a shame because when you look at like when we I was actually quite surprised myself when I started looking into Islamic history, how I mean I'm mean, going to touch on this as well, that Islamic is Islam is very tolerant towards other religions and Saladin himself and allowed freedom of worship for when he captured, I'd like to mention in the Crusades, that he allowed freedom of worship to other religions, whereas I doubt the Crusaders would have done the same to the Islamic. They would probably slaughter them in, in the, instead of allowing freedom of worship and passage into mm -hmm. Islam. Yeah, yeah, sorry, not in Islam, but Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, um, mostly Muslims. The thing is that there's this... Uh, sort of idea that Islam inher is inherently violent because of the concept of jihad and the way that some uh, parts of the Quran mention uh, fighting the 
so-called non-believers. Uh, and so it's sort of assumed that, the, that it's a part of Islam that you have to kill or fight non-Muslims. Um, but a lot of the Sharia was written 200 years after the Prophet. So there's a lot of room for interpretations. All kinds of interpretations of Islam exist. Uh, but overall, the Muslims didn't see the Christians or the Jews as so some sort of uh, as in the same way that Muslims uh, saw the no, the non Abrahamic religions, for example, the pagans of Arabia, or maybe even to some extent uh, the Zoroastrians. Yeah. So with Jews, Muslims had a good relation, but the relation with the Christians was a little bit deteriorated uh, because of the conflicts, political conflicts between uh, Muslim empires and Christian empires. And <laughs> maybe if there were Jewish empires back then, then maybe Muslims would have had a worse relationship with um, Jews as well. But overall, Muslims had a pretty decent relationship with these because Muslims felt that they carried the torch of tolerance, that they have to live be different than uh, the, the the way that the, for example, the Crusaders acted. Hmm. Um, so let's start. We know the I'm sure we know the long story ahead of us. And um, let's start from before Islam and the Arabian Peninsula, before the rise of Muhammad. So mm -hmm. what was the? I read a little bit. So I'm sure the reading a book called Age of Faith by Will Durant, which I highly recommend. And we I talked mm -hmm. to you about it quite a lot. Actually, but yeah, what, what was, he mentioned, talks about the Arabian Peninsula before Islam there as well, but what was it like, can you, can you tell me what the Arabian Peninsula was the, like before Islam? Yeah, the Arabic Peninsula in terms of religion was kind of a diverse place. Uh, most people there were what we would call pagans. Uh, they worshipped all these different gods, uh, deities, and uh, but there were a lot of Christians there and a lot of Jews. And there were actually... Um, I don't remember the name of the the sect of Christianity, but these were people who believed in Jesus as the Messiah rather than the Son of God or the Holy Spirit and all that. Yeah. Uh, so these people were also existed there. So when um, when Islam came around, it wasn't as revolutionary an idea as uh, a lot of people think that it was. Uh, but before Islam, uh, Arabia was mostly tribal, and no one was pretty much interested in that. To the, the giants to the north, the Byzantine Empire and the Sasanian Empire, they were not interested in Arabia, but they were interested in keeping it away from the other one. So um, they did pay tribes there to fight each other, to keep each other busy uh, while they fought each other and just, you know, make sure that the South uh, doesn't come out in any, uh, in any sort of violent eruption that uh, happened after Islam. Uh, so, yeah, um, and in terms of society, it was, uh, it was pretty, I guess, standard society for the time. The tribes were organized, they were organized into tribes. The status of women was, uh, as is mostly the case with uh, nomadic uh, societies, the status of women was not all that bad uh, and not as bad as um, maybe the assumption is. Uh, and, and yeah, in general, they were, um, as, as Arabia is a desert, there was a problem with the resources. So people did fight each other. But uh, over time, there became some, some places called harams, um, which were places that were considered sacred with some connection to a god. Uh, one one of the gods, and if that haram had some sort of an access to water, uh, it would become eventually it would um, become a city. Uh, this is the case with many oasis cities in northern Arabia, including uh, Medina, which uh, later became the capital of the Prophet, and Mecca was one of those harams, uh, and it had it had a shrine that tradition tells us was built by Abraham. And that is Islamic tradition, but the original uh, origins of of the the shrine is are unknown. Um, and Mecca was uh, not exactly a metropolitan city, but over time it became um, this small trading hub, not as big as as many people would. At least the Islamic tradition uh, tells us, but it was a small trading hub, um, and Eventually, from that trading hub, from that city, uh, the tradition of a prophet named Muhammad um, emerged. 
So he was born there in 571, tradition tells us, but there's dispute about the date. And I don't, I don't think the date is all that important either. Um, but yeah, that's where Islam began. Was it from a, from a rich family or was it from a, I guess, uh, middle class or poor family? What, yeah. what uh, was the status like? Most of the, the stuff that we know about him comes from tradition. Um, and the problem with the tradition is that it was written some 200 years after his death. So we have a problem with the sources there. Um, but uh, I think as uh, Fred Donner says in Muhammad and the Believers at the Origins of Islam, uh, that to say that, that that tradition is entirely false is wrong. And to say that the tradition is entirely right or accurate is also false. Um, we have I want to some... stop you right there because I'm, I want to know, do we only have Islamic sources on this or do you have any outside sources like when uh, Pliny the Younger, for example, who wrote letters to the Roman Emperor, I forget his name, I believe it was Diocletian, I might be wrong, but where, where he asked, what do we do with these Christians? Was, this, was there outside sources to document Muhammad or do we only have the uh... Islamic sources? We, we have mostly Islamic sources only. Um, all the non-Islamic sources, they come after the, the initial conquests that came some two years after the death of the prophet. Uh, these were Christian or Jewish sources or Zoroastrian even. Uh, they came in contact with Muslims. And at that time, they were interested in Islam, what Islam is. And so they do tell us some things, but not, not much of it is biographical, especially about the prophet. And even in terms of what the Muslims believed, it doesn't tell us much because all the things that they write about Muslims, for example, that the Muslims are circumcised or that the Muslims don't eat pork, uh, stuff like that is, is sort of the, the core of it. <laughs> Basically, all the stuff that they tell us about Islam is pretty much the same stuff that we know about, for example, Judaism. Uh, so at that point, if you read those sources only, you would not be able to tell the difference between Islam and Judaism. So yeah, most of the sources are, um, are Islamic. But... Um, those sources in themselves are, the, the traditional story is very much plausible, if not somewhat accurate. Um, I mean, obviously, whether the angel appeared to the prophet is uh, a matter of faith, but everything else... I mean, it is, could have been a dream, right? Like, uh, some, like he, he was dreaming yeah, that's, this or something? That's, uh, that's a matter of faith, I think. that You really cannot bring history onto that. No. Uh, but yeah. Uh, av everything after that is mostly plausible. He lived in in Medina in Mecca uh, for the first uh, his the, his career as a prophet can be divided into two parts, roughly thirteen years. Uh, the first one was thirteen years. The second one was uh, eleven years. Uh, the first part at, at the age of forty, the first revelation happened, and the age is uh, tradition tradition, not really exactly one hundred percent accurate. Uh, but the first revelation happened, and then he he accepted the mission of becoming God's prophet. So he preached to the people for uh, some 13 years. Uh, he came from the the, the, the the bigger tribe of the Quraysh, um, and in that, his house was called the House of Hashim. Uh, this was not a very rich house, but they were the leaders of the tribe. Um, there were other houses that were more powerful, uh, but because of respect and because of some people's political, um, I guess you can say diplomacy, uh, they were able to install themselves as chiefs. Uh, so he came from that family. His, his father had died, according to tradition, before he was born, uh, and his mother died when he was just a young boy. So he grew up uh, in the care of his uncle. Um, but at the age of 40 or so, he received the first revelation, and then he began preaching a message of uh, monotheism as compared to polytheism that the uh, Meccans followed. Uh, uh, I believe that, that you said Mecca was a, a trading town. Most people, they were pagan. Did they re How did the traders and merchants react to this? If I remember correctly, they were quite positive on Muhammad coming and yeah. preaching to a draw that they should follow. Right. Yeah. Uh, coming back to the to what I said about the harams, uh, a haram is a place which is associated with some religious figure, and this is a place where you cannot shed any blood, 
otherwise god or whatever god that is dedicated to uh, that uh, th this place is dedicated to would come after you um, so mecca was one of those harams islamic tradition tells us that abraham declared it a, a haram so it is still in the eyes of muslims a haram uh, but for we don't know who exactly it was a haram for uh, the meccans uh, and because of its status as a haram, because of, of a place where violence well, violence could not be um, could not occur, uh, it became a trading hub. And now, when Muhammad brought the message of uh, monotheism, um, all these gods who were assembled there, all these uh, different religious traditions that considered it a sacred place, uh, did not want did it its value as an economic hub. Uh, would diminish. Obviously, it would not no longer be sacred to all these other places. Um, sorry, all these other tribes that believed it sacred and conducted business there. So it had Muhammad's message had immense economic um, like potential to like disrupt the economy um, of Mecca. So the merchants, the traders, the chiefs, they always, they did uh, very much negatively react to Muhammad. But Muhammad was protected by his uncle. Uh, and in, in the tribal code, if you were to harm a member of a certain tribe uh, or a certain clan, then the, the entire clan would seek retribution against your entire clan. So nobody wanted to kill this man. Uh, rather, they just harassed him and his followers. The early followers were obviously, with mo as with most religion, the so-called rejects of society, the poor, the slaves, all these different kinds of people who, were, uh, who did not have a good standing in uh, society. So they were easy targets for persecution for harassment for torture for even murder uh, so overall it was they could not touch him the prophet so they touched they harassed his followers and then eventually he um told his followers to leave and go seek refuge with the king of ethiopia king of aksum uh, that again is a part of tradition because I'm not sure, I have not come across any source that mentions that Muslims did, in fact, find themselves in the court of the king of Aksum, of Aksum uh, which I think is a big omission. I mean, that should be part of some Aksumite document that these people have arrived, but no, uh, we have not found any document that says that. So what happens then? What happens next when they... So but, but let's set door for that and do a find refugee and what happens next? Uh, well, then Muhammad's, um, Muhammad's uh, uncle, he passes away. Uh, when he passed away, his, he was now without protection. The new chief, another uncle of Muhammad, uh, was not willing to protect his nephew. So now if the other tribes were going to kill him, uh, it was basically the tribe uh, of the Banu Hashim said that basically uh, if you kill him, we won't do anything about it. So now Muhammad feared for his life. Uh, so he, his, some of his followers were already in uh, Ethiopia and he himself started looking for another place to live. Uh, as it happens, the, the sacred place that Mecca was, it draw, it drew a lot of pilgrims and, uh, merchants and some of those merchants came from the nearby town of Yathrib. Now this was an oasis town. This was a town that had some agriculture as well uh, and it was something of a small met metropolis I guess you can say. Uh, it had these pagan tribes and it had a lot of Jews. Um, we don't know about the, the overall proportion of the two um, but it's generally said that the, the Jewish people, they made up most of the, uh, the economic backbone uh, of Yathrib, while the, the pagan tribes were mostly the agricultural folk. But I, I'm not sure that might just be a stereotype or something. Um, but in any case, um, these people, they invited Muhammad as an impartial uh, arbitrator to their city uh, to because he was charismatic and these people they liked what he what they heard uh, they invited him over to Medina uh, to Yathrib which would later become Medina to Yathrib uh, and then uh, the next year um, he moved there he made the um, migration which is uh, such a remarkable event in Islamic history that that's where the year one of Islamic Hijri calendar starts 
So he moves to Medina and then the next chapter of his life begins. Um, before his migration, um, the, the message of Islam in the Quran, in every, every other place is more religious, theological. It talks about the oneness of God. It talks about the end of days. It talks about hell, heaven, stuff like that. But when, um, when Muhammad moves to Medina, at this point, Islam shifts from <clears throat> just a from having a theological message to having a political and um, quote unquote legal um, message. And what's that message? What's the how does uh, it well, and why does it change? Because at this point, Muhammad was not just a prophet; he was now a political leader. He had a community that he was guiding. Um, he had his own followers, which came to be known as the Mahajirun, the people who uh, migrated. And he had these people from Medina who were helping uh, them, the, the so-called Ansar or helpers. Uh, and then he had these uh, Jewish people, Jewish tribes, whom he was helping arbitrate between uh, the Jew Jewish tribes and the pagan tribes and his own community. So he had to balance these three. Uh, and so at this point, Quran moves to talking more about legal systems, that this is how you should do this and this is how you should do that, rather than just saying that you have to be a good person in order to not go to hell and stuff like that. Um, and it's at this point that the first, the earliest biographical document of Muhammad's life comes to us. Uh, he writes a document there called the which is now called the ummah document um now, now hold on uh because i remember if I, I might be running this that it wasn't he had illiterate at one point as well or does it learn to write among the way uh no uh, most tradition mostly uh holds that he was illiterate that he couldn't read or write uh but there's some dispute about that i myself have disputed that claim uh, in some of my videos and I will be like returning to it uh, sometime later, but tradition usually holds that he was illiterate. And like by, by write a document doesn't mean that he actually wrote it with, your, with his own hand. Uh, he just composed the document. Mm -hmm. um, and that document is the, the basically it's, it's called by Muslims, it's often called the constitution of Medina. And it talks about how these different tribes, Jewish and pagan and Muslims, uh, and I'm calling them Muslims, but because but uh, they were not called the followers of Muhammad were not called Muslim at this point. Uh, how these three would interact with each other, what would uh, their connection be, what kind of political relationships they would have with each other. Uh, this is the document that starts all that. And uh, funny enough, today, Ummah or community only refers to Muslims, but in this document, uh, Jews, are also included in the ummah so it's it's likely do we have this document today or do you know if it's just we, disappeared? We, we do have that document today and it is even uh, the most skeptical authors do believe that this document is largely authentic it, it comes from that uh part that time so yeah it's it's a very it's a very interesting uh document it gives us a very interesting insight into uh, the early muslim community for example According to some scholars, um, the fact that Jews accepted this new prophet and the fact that um, he calls that the document calls uh, the Jews part of the Ummah, uh, it, it's a lot of scholars think that this means that Muslims at the time did not maintain themselves to be very different than Jews, maybe even a sect. Uh, in some ways of Jew, Judaism and Christianity, not really a different, entirely different tradition uh, as we see today, but rather a very, very much similar tradition. Maybe they didn't see Muhammad as a prophet, the Jews, I mean, uh, but rather they saw him as just a good man, a teacher, a charismatic leader, something like that, uh, sort of in the way that Muslims today look at uh, the Sikh, uh, the, the founder of the Sikh religion, Guru Nanak. Hmm. Now, Muhammad was himself a big fan of portraits, statues. Why, why was that? What's, why did he like portraits uh, or, the, or the, not the photographs, but paintings or statues? Mm -hmm. uh, he, as a Muslim, you cannot draw human form. People do, obviously, uh, but you, you, you cannot do that. It's prohibited in Islam uh, because there's a story that goes that Initially, there were these good people 
uh, this is shortly after Noah's death, like way back in the day of the Great Flood. Uh, and when Noah died, there were these people who were his students. And when they died, people made statues of them and then started worshipping them. Uh, so eventually it became the what Islam calls idolatry. Uh, so that's the reason that Islam prohibits human form, lest it be worshipped someday. And yeah, so, you know, if, imagine if uh, if we had a statue of Prophet Muhammad, it would be in every single mosque, it would be in every mm-hmm. single religious building, and that would be, in Islam's eyes, uh, close to worshipping idols. Mm-hmm. That's the reason. And in in most cases, Muslims today don't take offense if you draw someone, um, but it, the, the limitation is only to the prophets, Prophet Muhammad and mm-hmm. the other prophets that Islam... Uh, considers prophets and to some religious uh, figures for example the shias uh, they draw ali and uh, other members of um, of his family but sunnis don't do that sunnis uh, extend that prohibition to pretty much all the companions of the prophet and all the um, all the prophets now he spent some time in medina and i'm going to refer to his medina and but uh... He does return with an army eventually, doesn't he, to Mecca, yeah. if I remember correctly. Yeah, he comes into conflict while he's in Medina. His community is now starving, uh, so he starts raiding Meccan tribes. And he builds virtually a, blo- a blockade. Uh, the Meccans traded with Jerusalem. They stand, sent uh, caravans there. And between Jerusalem and Mecca is Medina. And Muhammad was in a good position to stop the caravans and raid them and loot them. Uh, so Muhammad started doing that. And it resulted in a virtual blockade of Mecca. And basically, it was kicking them in their pockets. Um, so he came into conflict with the Meccans. And there were battles, uh, three big ones, uh, the Battle of of Badr, the Battle of Uhud, and the Battle of um, the Trench. But eventually, he was able to secure enough following, enough alliances with different tribes, enough uh, even people from Mecca were defecting to Muhammad. Uh, so eventually, he was able to build an, an army big enough to actually uh, invade Mecca. Uh, it was mostly, a tradition tells us that it was mostly a bloodless uh, invasion because Mecca is a haram and you cannot kill people there. Um, mostly when they saw Muhammad's army, the city capitulated. Uh, but, you know, that's what the tradition tells us. Uh, but during this time, between uh, the conquest of Mecca and him arriving in Medina, uh, he did come into conflict with the Jews there. Uh, there, uh, The three Jewish tribes, the Banu Nadir, the Banu Qaynuqa, and the Banu Quraiza. Uh, he expelled the, the first two, the Banu Nadir and the Banu Qaynuqa, due, due to different uh, reasons. Uh, the Banu Qaynuqa were expelled because of a conflict in a market that ex- escalated, um, and the Banu Nadir were expelled from Medina because um, they were allegedly plotting to kill him. And then the Banu Qaynuqa. The Banu Qaynuqa is, is a very controversial story. Um, uh, there, uh, this is about the Battle of the Trench, that during the Battle of the Trench, the Meccans approached the Banu Qaynuqa and asked them to help against help against Muhammad uh, from inside Medina. Uh, and um, apparently, according to tradition, this is Islamic tradition again, uh, they agreed. So they betrayed Muhammad and they betrayed the uh, constitution, the so-called constitution of Medina. So over, overall, the, uh, this was why when Muhammad won the Battle of the Trench, he executed the entire male population of Banu Quraiza and enslaved the women and children of the tribe. And this is a very controversial thing to this day. Uh, but yeah, and then uh, it, there was another conflict against Jewish tribes because the tribes that he expelled and some other tribes, they went to the town of Khaber, which he invaded. And uh, this time he didn't um, expel them. He didn't kill them. Rather, he just imposed a tax on them uh, and kept them their town as it was without uh, causing any kind of economic damage. Mm. Now, I don't know if it's, this is too early to talk about this, but the could you... What about what? How, how does the Kaaba come into the picture? And what could you tell us for those of us who may not know as much about the Kaaba and why it is worship and, and the misconception if it's worshipped, why is it worshipped, and what's the story with the Kaaba? The Kaaba is not worshipped. Muslims worship nothing except God, Allah, as uh, Islam calls Him. 
Uh, and sometimes this is the reason that a lot of Muslims take offense with the term Muhammadan because it, it implies that we worship Muhammad. We don't. Um, Kaaba is also not worship. Kaaba is just a shrine. Um, which was allegedly built by Abraham, according to Islamic tradition. And uh, after the conquest of Muhammad uh, of Mecca by Muhammad, uh, it became sort of the religious center point of Islam. And the pilgrimage, pilgrimage, which took mostly traditions from pagan uh, pilgrimage, uh, sort of was inherited by Muslims. And now it is the, um, the site of the annual pilgrimage. So we go, uh, a Muslim, uh, once in their lifetime has to make the pilgrimage if they're able and so now it is the like the primary focal point of islam and what was the kaaba so the kaaba was there already by the time of muhammad yes it was already there and it's usually believed that uh, uh, it was uh, and islamic tradition also tells us this that it was uh, there were a lot of uh, idols stored inside the the kaaba to sort of create a sanctuary for all the gods of Arabia so that this land would be sacred for uh, all the religions and now no uh, one can shed any blood here. So this was sort of the uh, neutral ground for everybody in Arabia. And I asked if you've been there yourself and if so, what has it, what was it like if you've been uh, there? No, I haven't been there uh, myself. I am planning to go there, uh, but like uh, most people I know are very religious, including like my parents. Uh, and they, they say that it's sort of a life-changing experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but recently uh, there is something that uh, everybody who comes from there tells me in addition to the life-changing experience uh, that the clock tower next to it that was built by the Saud family, uh, by the Saudi government is, is, is sort of everybody who looks at it thinks of it as blasphemous, blasphemous uh, that it, it has cats casts a shadow on the Kaaba. And so it sort of creates a very negative image that that Islam initially Islam was supposed to be this egalitarian religion and uh, uh, this this religion where everybody was equal but the, the tower is literally sort of a symbol of status that uh, is just goes against everything that Islam teaches and that is that should be the focus of the prayer and also an, another thing about the the tower um it's actually built where it is because uh for muslims if you pray inside the haram it's like a lot more uh pious than it than to pray uh, outside the haram uh, but most pilgrims today they are camped outside the haram and then they go to the mosque to pray uh, if you have if you're rich and have a room in the clock tower uh, then you can pray the clock tower is in the haram so you can basically pray from inside your room so basically they're selling um piety to you if you're rich so okay so let's move on to how how does the quran come in the picture when is the quran written the quran according to muslims is the verbatim word of god it was re revealed to muhammad he did not write it uh it's it's the exactly the, the word of god that hmm. the angel gabriel uh then transmitted to the prophet. Uh, in terms of, of its human origins, we don't know that much. We don't know that much about it uh, because uh, not that much research has been done into it. You can assume why that is, uh, but there's a lot of mystery about it. Um, it was, but we know that by the year 700, it was mostly in the form that it is today. Um, so whatever changes happened, if, if any happened between the prophet's death and seven, 700, uh, we don't know about them, but the form that we see it uh, in today mostly existed by the year 700. And it is the guiding book of Islam. And Islam actually puts a lot of emphasis on its book and eventually, and so much that even that at one point, Islam was known as the cult of the book uh, because of how much, the book um how much the book is revered in islam i believe there is one of the oldest qurans in the book is at a british museum because of course why wouldn't it be and uh, i it, it was it was quite it, it's quite beautiful actually if you went and see the video the mm -hmm. where you can see the the oldest one of the oldest dated qurans in the world yeah. Yeah, and that is largely the same as uh, as the one that we have today, except for some vowel markers and some letter forms and stuff. So, mm. mean mostly the same thing. Mm. And 
what have now I want to draw on a little bit because as you know, as you know Islam spread on across around 20 years after Muhammad's death which is quite impressive for a new religion and so what happens after Muhammad passes away uh so he passed I, I feel like we skipped a few points but <laughs> uh no it's fine they're like yeah the basic thing is that he conquered mecca and then most of arabian tribes um became allies with him uh, but then he passed away in 632 and at that point the community of the muslims and i'm again calling them muslims but th there was they were not called back th this back then uh the community of the muslims now lead needed political leadership not religious leadership political leadership and there's some dispute about who should be the leader and that dispute actually continues today uh but what we do what happened was that his closest friend abu bakr becomes caliph caliph literally means successor so like successor to the prophet and in fact that's the full title khalifa to rasulullah the caliph of the prophet of allah uh, the successor of the prophet of allah so uh, Abu Bakr initially has to consolidate his control over Arabia. So he raises an army and he, he's, a, he's a very uh, brilliant and gifted politician. So he brings these tribes together into uh, a coalition and then he brings Arabia under his control. And now that he has an army, uh, he decides to invade the greater Middle East, what we call the greater Syria. Uh, and this is land that is being controlled by the Sasanians and the Byzantines, both of which have been fighting for the past 90 years. And if you want to like go back to Greeks and Persians, then all the way back to antiquity. Uh, so these two empires, they're tired and exhausted. And at that point, the Muslims attack them. Uh, and with incredible speed within 20 years Abu uh, Bakr dies two years after the prophet and then comes the reign of uh, his advisor uh, Omar uh, and Omar continues the the mission of conquest so everything from Tunisia to modern day Afghanistan comes under the control of this new Muslim empire within 20 years uh, the society this is this is not the Maya conquest right this, you said, told me that there was an empire before them what were they called I don't I don't remember this is not then, the Umayyad Caliphate, this is the Rashidun Caliphate. Uh, this is uh, a caliphate of the companions of the Prophet. Um, Rashidun means the rightly guided ones. So you can assume that the Sunni Muslims, they revere uh, these caliphs very much. Now, actually, when Muhammad, I want to go back again a little bit, because it's, this, when it's been Muhammad's death that we see the split between Shiite and Sunni, or is it later? <laughs> Uh, the actual sh split between the two communities happens much later, but the, the story of the split goes all the way back. Um, when Muhammad dies, there's a dispute whether Abu Bakr should succeed him or whether his cousin and son-in-law Ali should succeed him. Uh, so there's, a, there's this dispute, but stuff happens. Tradition tells us a lot of different stories, uh, but whatever happens, Abu Bakr becomes a uh, caliph. But there is, there was still at the time a community, a small community of Muslims who believed that the that the Prophet's family has the right to rule Muslims. They should rule Muslims because they are the Prophet's family, and you know the, the Shia tribal. You can call them Shias. Yeah. Uh, they were not Shias at this time. They were I, what I call proto Shias. Um, like this is the group that would later become Shias. But they believed that a member of the Prophet's family should be uh, caliph. And then eventually, uh, in the 10th century, um, we see a rise. Uh, we have the Abbasid Caliphate, which has just declined. Uh, let, it's the year, let's say, 900 or so. Uh, we have the Abbasid Caliphate that is declining. We have Muslim control overall slipping through, throughout the Middle East, except uh, maybe in Spain. Uh, so we have two Shia dynasties come to the forefront. The first is the Fatimid Caliphate. They rise from Tunisia and then they build their base in uh, in Egypt. I think uh, Egypt was conquered in the year 969 or so. I'm not sure, but I think that's the year it was conquered. So they form their own caliphate there, the Fatimid Caliphate, a very decent caliphate centered on Egypt. But from northern Persia, we also see another dynasty called the Buids come to the forefront around the same time as the Fatimids did. Uh, these people were Shias as well, and they come to conquer 
almost everything that the Abbasids ruled. And then they turned the Abbasid Caliph into a puppet. So this this century, the ninth century, the tenth century is called the Shia century because of these two Shia powers. Basically, uh, everything east of Morocco and west of India was under Shia control. Uh, but and it's at this point that the real divide between the Shias and the Sunnis start to emerge. Uh, uh, it's at this point that the identities start to be seen for the first time. A lot of uh, Shia theology is written this point, this time. A lot of their rituals are defined this time because of the political, um, political dispute, political hostility between the Sunni Abbasids and the Shia Fatimids, sort of like what we're seeing with Sunni Saudi Arabia today and Shia uh, Iran today. So this is when the split actually happens, but it goes all the way back to the death of the prophet. Mm. And then because the Umayyad, there's really amazing uh, culture, po poetry, and architecture. And where was this empire the same that they fo really focused on astronomy and our poetry, architecture, etc. And and I, I wanted to ask one more, one more thing when they started building more mosques and in when it's the religion spread, how did they find out when how to pray towards Mecca? Did they just take a chance that this is the way towards Mecca at this point in time? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stories about that. Um, there's dispute about it. Uh, early mosques, some mosques uh, do point to other directions. Uh, some point to Mecca, some point to Petra, some point to just mm -hmm. random directions. Uh, they didn't always know this. Uh, early on, since they didn't know how to actually find the site of um, Mecca, they relied on what's called folk astronomy. They looked at the stars and they tried to find the real location, but sometimes they didn't succeed in that. Uh, so in, for example, Egypt, we see some mosques uh, that are that are oriented towards the direction of the sunrise uh, on the summer solstice, because the Egyptians before Islam and before Christianity had a big emphasis on astronomy. Uh, in in Cordoba, uh, we see a mosque that is pointed south because um, that's where, because the man who built it, Abdul Rahman, was from Damascus. And from Damascus, he would have to build a, a mosque facing south uh, in order to get it to face Mecca. Uh, and so he copied that. Basically, his idea was that if you lift the mosque of Cordoba and put it in Damascus, uh, it would have the right Qibla. Qibla is the direction of the prayer. So, uh, so do you think that this is one of the reasons why why the Islamic world prospered in astronomy and science when because they try to find out how do we find the right way towards Mecca? Uh, no, I don't think that that the sole reason for Muslims to work on geometry and astronomy was to find the direction of, of Mecca. Uh, obviously, they funded scholars and a lot of different things were worked on from astronomy, astrology, um, you have poetry, architecture, medicine, mathematics. Uh, and the reason that Islam prospered, that the Islamic empires prospered in that is because they were ideally located. Um, they had the input of money and knowledge from pretty much everywhere, China, India, Europe, uh, Greece. And so that's one of the reasons that it prospered. And I think that the, the fact that Muslims were able to now more accurately find the Qibla uh, was more a sight more uh, uh, a result of this prosperity rather than a reason for this prosperity. And um, you touched a little bit about this, but I want to know a little bit more why why were in, is Muslims so more much more tolerant towards other religions but versus like where Christianity was not as tolerant at all when you see, especially during the Crusades, for example, when slaughter of Jews and uh, other religions on the way to mm -hmm. Jerusalem happens. And then, of course, they had to pay a small tax to be able to have freedom of worship. But why were they so? Can you elaborate a little bit more on why they were so much more tolerant towards other religions mm -hmm. and worship? Well, early on, uh, Muslims were in a minority, at least till the year 1000. Muslims were in a minority throughout their empire. Initially, when the Muslims conquered this huge empire, uh, there were less than 5% of the people in the, the empire, the Umayyad empire, let's say, uh, were, were Muslims. So no, they kind of- 
I remember there were also a little bit, I think it was in your one of your videos that I watched, you were talking about this, that they were a little bit hesitant towards converting as well, because they yeah. wanted the extra tax money for them. Yeah, they were hesitant towards converting them as well, because they made more money from the um, the, the non-Muslims. But overall, Muslims didn't really see Christians and Jews as some other religion, some weird cult or something uh they saw these religions as uh their own cousins and brothers uh, uh because um they they saw these religions as the previous renditions of the same message uh muslims call jews and christians the people of the book that these are uh that they're at the core there is the truth but um stuff on the outside has changed and also the arabs they call themselves the Banu Ismail. Ismail, if you know, was the brother of um, of Ishaq, uh, who is remembered. Um, what is it, Ishaq or is it Yaqub, who is remembered, uh, who is the the progenitor of the. Um, in any case, uh, he uh, they saw the the Israelites, the Jews, as their cousins, because both of them drew. Uh, their connection back to Abraham, a genealogical connection back to Abraham. So Muslims were more tolerant to them. Um, and overall, I think it just because Muslims had been exposed to, you know, exposure breeds tolerance. So Muslims had been exposed to the Christians and the Jews and the Zoroastrians for a long time. And they didn't see them as some sort of uh, out of this, out of their comfort zone. They saw them as, as people who, whom they had known uh since before islam so they didn't really um like crack down on them they didn't try to convert them there were instances of that but overall this was the case but also i think uh that muslims had this desire to be different because early islamic literature focuses a lot on piety it says that the, the world is corrupt and you are the only righteous righteous people and so they wanted to be different i think to some extent they wanted to be different than uh the the empires around them these empires that uh, that had persecuted people based on their religion so the muslims they wanted to be different uh saladin for example made a point of being different than the crusaders who had 90 years earlier conquered Jerusalem and slaughtered the Muslim population. He wanted to be different than them and he wanted to uh, give everybody freedom of worship and of living and all that. Yeah. And obviously when you talked about them, they started attacking the Byzantines, but when did the first, when did, when did the Byzantines and Europe start seeing Islam as a threat, as this big threat towards Christianity, that this is something we need to deal with right now? Now, maybe not right now, but like, this is something, we, this is a problem, this is something uh -huh. we need to well, do. Almost immediately after the death of the Prophet, when the Muslims broke into uh, the greater Middle East, mm. um, the Byzantine Empire was now facing this huge threat, maybe even an existential threat uh, from their perspective. Um, so they did um, they did see these these Arabs as a threat. But the conflict to draw the conflict to the con conclusion of Islam or a new religion versus Christianity, I think we have to come to slightly before the Crusades, uh, because most early sources uh, don't refer to Muslims as uh, to these conflicts as Christians versus Muslims, they call Muslims by different names other than their religions. Uh, they call them the Ismailites, the Arabs, the Saracens. The uh, and this is an interesting one. Uh, they even call them the Mahajirun. Or uh, in Syriac, it's different. I think it's a uh, Mahagarai or something like that. But it basically means the Mahajirun, which means the migrants. And this is then the title that uh, Muhammad's followers took who the people who converted uh, who moved from mecca to medina so this conflict i think to divide it into religion religious conflict came shortly before maybe 100 or so years before the crusades uh, that's when we start to see the shift of narrative that this is a new religion it is an enemy of christianity and we have to do something about this mm -hmm. And uh, as, as I said earlier, the, the expansion of Christian, of sorry, Islam was on the span of 20 years, again, which I said is quite impressive considering it becomes such a huge religion in such a short age span, where Christianity didn't become 
a mainstream religion until Constantine in 330, yeah. when he converted to supposedly converted to Christianity. So it's it's quite impressive how fast the religion grew in itself. Yeah. But uh, the overall conversion of Islam was slow, uh, but like um, it did expand very early. And that's because that's why Islam was canonized so early. That's why the Quran was uh, in, in, the, in the current form so early. I mean, Bible didn't come into this form in just 70 years after the death of Jesus and Torah. We have no uh, real answers for. Uh, but that's because that's why because Islam was now a political force and the Muslims were now rich enough to do these kind of things to codify their religion, to establish some sort of a, a religious tradition rituals and all that so that's that's the reason and maybe maybe even who knows uh i i think that if and i don't really like to talk about alternative history but i think if the muslims had not um conquered this land then maybe i i personally think that the turks from central asia would have conquered um would have conquered um iran persia and then they would have pushed against the Byzantines and who knows how far they would have gone. And these were tribal people, uh, something like the Arabs themselves. And so the conflict between the Arabs and the Turks would have been, God knows what that would have been like. But I think that that one point could have shifted the entire balance of the world. And thank you. So I think we covered the basics of the rise of Islam. Thank you so much for taking your time to come on the podcast. And again, congratulations on the 100K. I'm trying to get 100 subscribers myself at the moment. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this has been about that. Do you have anything to promote, I assume? Any social media where people might find you? Uh, yeah, obviously they can uh, go onto my channel on YouTube, Al Muqaddama, uh, and uh, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And I think I'm also on Facebook. Yeah, I'm also on Facebook. Sorry, I forget these kind of things. Uh, but yeah, people can find me there. My name is Adam. Please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, we're on YouTube, wherever you can find podcasts. And also, I would like to add, please consider rating us on iTunes. It doesn't take much time. It's just like one minute. You can even rate us one star if you like. Please don't. But we, if you want to, absolutely want to, go ahead. My name is Alan. We are available on Instagram and on the world that age as well. Next time, we will have Jeremy Black on the podcast to talk about military warfare. My, my name is Alan. This has been about that age as well. And I'll see you next time.